So uh, we'll get started here. My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is February 14th, 2022. Um, and I will call this being to order. Um, so the, the big news today really is that we are announcing that we will be in opening our pre-qualification intent to apply process in 30 days. We're doing that 30 day notice um, today. So um, you can, uh, for everyone watching, um, you can do the pre-qualification pre process starting March 16th. Um, we're gonna roll out much more information on this um, within the next 30 days. Um, we do have some information up on our website and, um, you know, Nelly uh, will be kind of communicating with people um, through our website, over the phone and on our social media in the coming weeks about the kind of nuts and bolts of pre-qualification. Um, uh, just a few, just quick overview or high, high points though, that getting pre-approved um, really is not a license to operate. Um, it's an initial approval by the board that your business, um, including all of your investors that you submit to the board during the pre-approval process, have been cleared, that they don't have anything in their criminal history record or in their other um, kind of ownership interests that would disqualify them from being a licensee. So um, our rules do not require anyone to get pre-approved. Uh, prior to applying for a full license. This is a voluntary process that we created as a board to help facilitate the licensing process for both the board and for um, prospective licensees. Um, we think that there are benefits uh, to the pre-approval process. Um, first, of course, is that you can know that you are not disqualified from being a licensee for any reason. And the earlier you know this, the better. Before you make any sort of investments or before you sign any leases, you know, getting pre-approved is probably a good idea. Um, so we've also heard that because this is such a new industry that uh, many towns um, and financial institutions and insurance companies, et cetera, really want to see something, um, some approval by the board that um, you know your your business uh, could operate in this one. You could you know you're somewhere in the process of getting a license. So there's another benefit um, to getting pre-approved. And then um, this essentially splits the application process into two steps, um, meaning that your final application process will necessarily be shorter, and the board can review it much more quickly because we're really just kind of filling in. Um, the parts of the application that we haven't looked at um, during the pre-approval process. So just to reiterate, this process is voluntary. It's not required. Um, if you want to wait until the full application window for your specific license type opens, of course, um, that's your prerogative. Um, this pre-qualification process is something that we created um, because it helps the board with some of the more time-consuming time aspects of um, the application process. And we think that there actually are genuine benefits to uh, prospective applicants. Um, but if everyone um, who's thinking about this should really take a close look at the guidance that we put out and what's in our rules to make sure that this makes sense for you um, as a business. Anything that anyone would like to add on the pre-approval process at this point, noting that we will have guidance um, on our website? I don't think so. Yep. Very exciting. Yep. Okay, so again, that we're, this is the announcement of the beginning of the 30-day notice window. So the actual date is March 16th. Big day. Um, so uh, we also uh, last week had our second social equity and economic empowerment networking event. Um, Julie, would you mind just kind of updating us on how that went? Yeah, we had somewhere between 40 and 44 people that came in and out throughout the event. The chat is always very active, which is great. Um, people connect there. And we have been, um, I, I've been sharing with Nellie any contact information that's shared in that chat. Um, and then she emailed it out to all of the registered participants. So there's, a, you know, people are sharing resources. That's a way that we're sort of um, sharing those back out so that people can have those um, in their inboxes. We had 
Cheryl Murray Powell um, speak, who she's an attorney, but she's also a hemp farmer. She has an extensive resume. I won't um, go all over it now, but um, and she's agreed to share her PowerPoint slides, so we'll have those. Um, we also had um, Reginald um, Stanfield from Justin uh, Just Incredible Cultivation in Massachusetts, who um, you know. It, very nicely after Cheryl sort of talked about, you know, how to set up a, a business plan, talked about what his direct experience was like, as did Ashley Reynolds, who is one of our advisory committee members, talked about what her kind of local experience setting up a, a plan was like, um, and shared a lot of her, like, if somebody had told me what to do, this is what it would, would, would have been nice to know from the get-go. So I think it was really helpful for folks. There was a lot of conversation about insurance and banking. So if perhaps that's our next um, round, I think that would be really helpful. And there were some resources I think that we'll be able to leverage um, that were shared there. So I think that is pretty much pretty much everything Great. from that session. Great. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. yeah. They are, um, I should say this, they are intended to be all online right now. We have had one person show up in person um at the last each of them which is fine um or has been fine because there's been somebody here but if one of us wanted to do this from home um there would be no one here to let them in so they are intended to be um entirely remote that's great thank thanks for doing that i think mean, it adds a lot of value um, for sure and we're trying to do them once every two weeks so the next one i think would be the 24th of yes. february yep. yep okay um just a reminder also that rules three and four are in their official comment period, which runs, I believe, through February 25th. David, is that? That's right, yeah. Yep, February 25th is the official close of the comment window for rules three and four. Um, please, if you have an opportunity, please read through them um, and send us your thoughts, your comments, um, anything that you think the board needs to hear um, about rules three and four. We will be holding our um, public hearing for rules three and four this Friday at 11 a.m. So other than that, um, just need to approve the minutes. Uh, Julie, Kyle, have you had a chance to review them from February 7th? Yes. All right, I take a motion to approve. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye, okay. Um, and then moving to the agenda. Um, today we're really, again, trying to fill out our, um, our rules with a guidance document. Um, and so uh, we're kind of taking it one issue at a time and trying to kind of make sure that, you know, what we're saying in the rules is clear and that people have a way to kind of follow um, what they all mean. Um, and so we're gonna start today with looking at our safety information flyer. Again, this is a document um, that's required by law to be handed out at the point of sale or at least offered at the point of sale to kind of really supplement um, the health warning. Uh, you know, not a lot can fit on a tiny little health warning. And so this is um, designed to kind of give people some additional information. So Julie, I'll turn things over to you on this. Yeah, I don't have um, a document to share just yet because I think this is one of those things that needs to be vetted through a variety of different um, entities and people, including the Department of Health. So um, I'll just share the process that I'm working through. So I went through you know, our rules, I went through um, within the law, I went through what we've talked about in the public health subcommittee and what I proposed related to this back in October, um, created some, um, some words to go along with that and shared them with um, uh, the prevention community to kind of get a sense of, because I, I was trying to look for people who had a good sense of like how to communicate information um, in a way that, that people would be receptive to and easy to find on the document and so forth. So I'm getting some feedback from the prevention community on that. When it's a little bit more um, put together, I'll share it with the Department of Health and get their feedback as well to do that in consultation with them. And also probably circle around with our public um, health subcommittees to just get some of their um, thoughts as well. So that's kind of the process that I'm working through this week. Um, just some high points on it. We did, you know, in my conversations with the prevention community, it really is intended to be written for folks who've already decided that they're intending to purchase or consume. So it's not meant to, you know, shame someone who has made a purchase. Um, and also to make um, some safety information clear, like once you get cannabis home and you have children in the home, where you place it, what are the recommended 
um, things to do um, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the importance of this document needs to be vetted. So, you know, just I think that that's a good strategy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie. You? OK, um, next is the inhalable additives. So I did put together a little presentation. Your little Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you caught that, huh? <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to full screen that because it makes it tough to use my notes because um, I have notes, but I think everyone everyone can see that fine, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So just uh, if anyone thought we had kind of made it through all the difficult issues, um, this one certainly uh, can get tricky quickly. OK, so here, just a reminder of what we said in rule. This is from rule 2, 2.6.4, um, additives. So the first sub A, you know, is really about oral uh, or edibles, um, you know, additives for ingestible, orally ingestible um, items. The, the B and C really apply to, well, C applies to everything, but C is really about um, additives for products that are intended for inhalation. So we said that we would maintain an improved ingredient list um, that will be ready available to the public. I'm not positive that uh, that's the best approach, but we'll see. Um, so just wanted to pull up quickly what um, you know you saw in sub C that manufacturers shall abide by, by any prohibition contained in 868A4. So that here's 868A4. Um, so this is the prohibited product section of the law. And um, just jumping down to four, sub four, um, flavored oil cannabis products sold prepackaged for use of battery um, powered devices and any cannabis flower that contains flavors, characterizing flavor that's not naturally occurring in the cannabis. So that's just an o general overlay for all cannabis products, including oils. And that includes um, products that are sold for medical use or just the adult use? This is Sorry. just adult use. Okay. So just some general um, background. Um, so additives for vape cartridges, I'm mostly thinking about vape cartridges here. Um, they're usually flavorings um, or these you know, are intended to kind of mimic the flavors and effects of certain cannabis cultivars, like, you know, Blue Dream or OG Kush or something like that, or dilutants. Um, dilutants are used for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, two of the kind of common ones really are to kind of, I guess, water down an oil so it's not so thick and it, it helps kind of with the, um, the process of heating it up. Um, it kind of overcomes some of the hardware limitations in, in, in certain types of vapes, um, vaping devices. And then also, you know, it, it helps to increase profit margins. Um, and so additives can um, be derived from natural sources or produced synthetically. Natural flavor um, usually indicates uh, cannabis or other plant derived, but it can also mean um, kind of any natural source, yeast, animal, animal byproducts or fermentation. Artificial um, just means it's not natural. It's a synthetically produced flavor. Um, there's another distinction that starts to come in just in the kind of vape world. Just either it's a cannabis derived additive or a non cannabis derived additive. And um, just the kind of common dilutants MCT, PG, PEG, um, those are all acronyms. I don't have the, what they stand for right now. Um, you know, just uh, as a general point, 
um, Oregon, after the Avali scare, really did a deep dive into all of their vape, vaping products. And they just, one statistic of many in this report that they recently released is that over 50% of the additives in their vape products that are on their shelves right now have both natural and artificial additives. So a huge number of them um, use both. So prior to the Evoli or Volley, um, kind of there's roughly 3,000 hospitalizations and, and almost 70 deaths. Um, very few states regulated additives. Um, they had very general types of warnings like, you know, um, cannot be a known carcinogen or something along those lines. Very general, but that was the kind of limit of what they said in their rules around additives. Um, and really, it's, it comes from the fact that there are no reliable studies on the effects, especially the long-term effects of inhaled additives. Um, there's plenty of food additives. There's um, starting to be more about um, smoked additives, but it's really this process um, of kind of heating up and then inhaling that there's very few long-term um, studies that have been done. Um, usually, you know, they come... Uh, after a major event like the Diwali. Um, and even, even then, you know, uh, vitamin E acetate was really kind of the main suspected cause of the kind of Bali um, symptoms. But the CDC is not willing to say that it was conclusively vitamin E acetate. Um, it was fat, vitamin E acetate was fine in kind of 94% of the ones that they tested. But so were a list of other things. So, um, and then, um, and then another complicating factor to trying to, um, you know, regulate additives is that the vast majority of additives are produced by companies like third-party companies like flavor houses um, that are not regulated by any government entity to provide products meant for inhalation. You know, they're they're essentially creating food additives, and all their regulations are designed around um, flavors that are legal to ingest but not inhale so you know you're buying this you know this serum of flavor in bulk and you're not you know everyone's saying that it's safe for for food but it's not safe for vapes but everyone's kind of just tiptoeing around that mm -hmm. um and then a lot of these flavor houses these companies protect the ingredients they say that they're trade secrets even from regulators in you know even cannabis regulators they're they're not disclosing what's in their concentrations and then again i mentioned they really um you know i i hate to say they're hiding behind this but they're they're saying things that are factually accurate but they know that you know they're selling these tinctures these kind of flavor additives or vape cartridges but they're labeling them saying that they're fda approved or they're RAS approach, you know, generally recognized as safe, um, but that does not mean safe for inhalation, um, and the FDA is very clear on that. So let's see, where's my mouse? So that just makes things a little bit complicated. What else? <laughs> Is there um, so um, as I mentioned, post. Volley or volley, a number of states began to really take this issue seriously around vape cartridges um, and what's in them. Um, and there's a number of strategies that are starting to emerge as kind of best practices um, around the country or in the legal states. First strategy is to ban um, the ingredients that are starting to be known as at least causing short term or, or acute um, safety risks. Um, top of the list, vitamin E acetate, MCT oil is one of the dilutants in the PEG is another dilutant that we looked at. Um, so Oregon also prohibited uh, squalene, um, which is a terpene. So, and it's actually found in cannabis plants. So, you know, you'd think that you could just say only naturally occurring terpenes or even go a step further, only cannabis derived terpenes. However, um, they're finding that um, even squalene uh, and squalane, which is a hydrogenated version, um, is toxic when inhaled. Um, so, 
um, you know, it's not just as simple as kind of like, well, let's just stick to the kind of cannabis, cannabis derived terpenes. Um, Washington has banned synthetic terpene additives. Um, um, you know, allowing only terpenes from the cannabis plant or other molecularly identical botanical terpenes. Other states um, require labeling um, and a product manufacturing process or a pre-approval process. And then Nevada um, says that any additives um, need to be less than 10% of the, the, the whole product, the whole package. So um, just for a point of context, um, terpenes naturally occur at about 6% in the cannabis plant. Um, so that's kind of a, somewhat of a natural ceiling or, or an average ceiling about how much terpenes are kind of in, a, in flower. And yet um, a lot of vape products in totally unregulated states have greater than 40% of the terpenes and other additives put in. Um, and so Nevada kind of said, you know, we don't know if there's a negative health effect of having 40% or greater terpenes uh, ratio, but, um, you know, for now, let's limit it to 10%. So this is kind of the one basic strategy um, or best practice. Two is having a product ingredient packaging pre-approval process. We are pushing for this um, currently, as we all know, we have, we're, we're, we have a product registration fee or we will um, kind of require people that are creating new vape cartridges um, to kind of put them before the board, let us know what's in them, um, review, have us review the ingredients, see if there are known public health or consumer, consumer safety concerns, and then also take a look to make sure that um, all the labeling and packaging reflects those. Um, four states, um, and I think, this is soon to be five or six, um, require ingredient disclosures in their track and trace system. Um, I know all the major kind of the, the big track and trace systems have kind of a drop down menu now for product manufacturers to enter specifically their additives. Um, and it really helps for kind of product recalls. So strategy three is kind of a related point. Um, ensure that your track and trace systems have the capabilities to quickly quickly recall products that present co consumer safety risks. Um, you know, I think what happened in Massachusetts, the governor, I think, called a state of emergency and, and put a stop sale on all vape cartridges. But this could be more along, this could be a more targeted approach if we find that, you know, some specific dilutant um, is causing hospitalizations that um, you don't have to kind of take the, the broad approach. You can really just limit it to the, the, the products that um, have that ingredient as one of their, uh, or want that additive as one of their ingredients. And then, um, I mean, this is just another related um, point. Just don't let companies hide behind trade secrets. You can, you can have a confidential reporting to the board of trade secrets um, that's not a public document if if we want to go that route. Um, but um, essentially just we need to know what's in these things. And then finally, just, um, you know, th this uh, is about ensuring that the actual vaping device is not kind of leaching heavy metals into the, the cartridge or into, you know, or, or harming people. Um, again, there's a number of states that, that have these strategies. You know, it's hard to really know the best language to use on this, but there, there's some kind of suggested um, strategies in this. Just inert materials, coil doesn't touch the vaping li liquid. Um, temperature controls. So um, those are four strategies that we can think about. Um, I thought what would be good also, just because, um, you know, one of the complications here is that it's really hard when you have literally thousands of products on the shelves 
to go back and change the rules for people. Um, you know, you essentially you're it's it's hard to kind of after the fact recall, you know, hundreds and hundreds of products. So I thought it might be beneficial for us to look at New Jersey, um, which has not fully come online yet, but they, you know, they wrote their rules post Diwali with this concern very much in mind. Um, and they did it, you know, they wrote their rules, you know, obviously before products are on the shelves. So they kind of have a very comprehensive approach, I feel like that might be instructive for us. Um, they have a list of banned substances, um, which you can see, which is part of the um, strategy uh, that's kind of it being adopted. Then they also link to any ingredient that's on this FDA, potentially harmful um, for tobacco and tobacco smoke. So again, like there's not, it's not a perfect corollary between cigarettes. Um, and this is not e-liquids. This is not like tobacco vapes. This is um, things that are banned from cigarettes. And it's a list of probably about 30 substances um, that uh, have been, you know, deemed harmful or potentially harmful. And, you know, whether we can pull it up and take a look, but it seems to me that that's a pretty common sense approach. I noticed that they didn't include MCT in their band list. Do you know so why? So it might be. Or is it in that other? Is it in the sort of catch-all number six? It's probably in the catch-all. Okay. I think. I think that's one that's pretty universally noted to be poten potentially harmful. Okay. Um. I included this. This is about um, active ingredients. They, you know, cannabis intended for inhalation and vaporization um, have to be cannabis derived um, or botanically derived terpenes. So this is essentially saying they have to be natural and some kind of oils and fats like animal oils and fats would be excluded. Um, and then they also have this kind of 10% rule. No, you know, the, the additives cannot exceed 10% of the product. And then finally, there's a waiver provision, which kind of allows for new um, new additives to be approved by the board. But it's re they really kind of shift the onus to the product manufacturer um, to say that um, you have evidence that this is safe, um, essentially, or not harmful. Um, so you know, it's kind of they they have a catch-all in there too, which is which is great. Um, So that's the end of the presentation. Um, there's no like conclusions in this. I thought it would be just good primer for us to start thinking about which approaches we want to adopt. Um, you know, whether we want to have kind of a prohibited list or we want to have an approved list. It's, it's really those types of questions are kind of, you know, ones that we're going to have to settle, but it's probably worth taking some time and thinking about this. Honestly, looking at some of the, the, the reports that are starting to now to be published from people states, Oregon, I mentioned, just did a really comprehensive review. Um, Massachusetts has a um, research team that I'm sure has done something on this. I'm not sure. And Colorado has a whole kind of medical committee that's looking at um, additives. So you know, it's probably good for us to do to not decide anything here today, but to really kind of recognize this subject an evolving subject and that um, you know there are there are strategies out mm -hmm. there good so good thank, thank you. you all right okay so a little bit of background. So we did say <clears throat> in our rule that we would put a lot of testing parameters and action limits into a guidance document, board policy, what have you. And, and the reason for that is it allows the board to be a little bit more nimble and flexible. Should we, you know, kind of related to what you're talking about, should we need to respond to a public health issue? Something isn't working, testing is too onerous. You know, a lot of this was created to kind of allow us to move quicker than the regulatory process can sometimes move on its own. 
And another, you know, by way of background right here, we have uh, microbiological parameters and limits, metal parameters and limits, pesticide parameters and limits, and residual solvent parameters and limits. Uh, potency is not in here. Obviously, that's in statute. Um, so it's not it's referenced to in our rules, but it's it's lives and breathes and, you know, by the letter of the law in statute. And then moisture isn't really here. Don't necessarily expect that to change or for us to respond as as readily um, for moisture content purposes and what we set those specific levels at. So, you know, this this comes 100 percent from my notes and reviewing the lab the lab subcommittee from our advisory committee's discussions on certain very um, interesting points and issues that were developed over the course of the fall. A lot of this comes already from um, the pesticide program at VAFM, also what the, um, the current hemp program has done from a residual solvent perspective and a metal perimeter and limit perspective. Um, Dr. Hom, I'm sure everybody here remembers our friend Dr. Hom. He's uh, a renowned expert in microbiological testing, and these were his suggestions. And even in talking with him a little bit further, trying to understand these action limits because I am not a chemist <laughs> and I do not work in a laboratory. You know, I think we're trying to balance um, what is the appropriate public health level for us to really be looking at things at versus, you know, is this practical in effect? Will plants continuously fail some of these parameters? Will labs be able to, with certain instruments be able to test to a certain um, degree, for lack of a better phrase, and I'm sure I'm getting some terminology wrong. Um, so that being said, you know, this is kind of where the committee shook out. I did run this by Carrie. Um, I'd like to send it to the Bale Lab, the Vermont Ag and Environmental Lab, to make sure they fully understand things. Um, but this was pretty much, um, had already been kind of vetted out, and I think we just decided as a board when we were looking at forming our proposed rules to take all of this information and put it into guidance versus putting in our in our rules. So this has not changed at all, um, even dating back to November when we were first making those considerations. It's great, yeah. And so just again, just for my clarity here, we put this into guidance so that we can change it. We can add to it, we can subtract from it, we could change the action levels because based on whatever the new science is. You know? Yeah. So yeah. And I and David could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there is kind of a trigger in our rules where if we are going to change something, we'll give 90 days head, head uh, 90 days notice. So everybody has clarity that action levels are changing. I'm sure that there's some exemption to that if we need to respond to a specific incident or something like that accordingly. Um, but we won't be looking to change these, you know, like the stock market fluctuates, so to speak. <laughs> you know, so they'll be static until we see the need to change them. Okay, and I do have one more document that I have been working on. This one kind of kind of in line with um, Julie's first presentation. This is still a very much a work in progress, and I'll try and blow this up a little bit. But this is a lot of the waste language um, that the Sustainability Committee settled on. And what you're seeing here is the star of a guidance document. Um, that will get way more specific over time. I'm still needing to run a lot of the way that this fits together from a, a puzzle piecing perspective with the, you know, ANRDEC solid waste program, Agency of Agriculture. We're still in this kind of weird go between between, you know, this not being a farm product but a plant and DEC having control uh, because it's not technically farming. So one of the things that we did. Um, kind of settle on in that committee when we did hear from folks in the solid waste program is a DEC would look to, to consider cannabis to be what they call leaf and yard residual material, meaning it can be composted just like all other vegetative content in the state. And there is some triggers in there where if a compost hauler is not willing to take it, you can then dispose of it via landfill. But I think what we're trying to do here is provide some type of comfortability to composters that they're not hauling high THD cannabis around the state that could result in other public safety concerns for the composting company, but also allowing certain exemptions, um, recognizing that not every part of the cannabis plant can result in, you know, THC being activated without, you know, being decarboxylized and stuff like that. So we did have some language in our rule saying that cannabis or cannabis products must be rendered unusable and unrecognizable for disposal. 
a lot of that has to do with, again, the comfortability of certain composters to take it. Um, other states have required that it be mixed with, um, almost every other state, honestly, has required that it be mixed with 50% organic material. That's going to be an option here. The sustainability committee kind of, and Jacob had presented that that was something that um, was found in the early stages of Colorado and like Washington's programs that turned out to be more of a waste generator than people actively digging through certain, you know, compost facilities, landfills to try and, you know, smoke some flour that's been, you know, already disposed of. But there, <laughs> but, you know, it still could be an option. That being said, what the sustainability committee wanted to do was provide an exemption for rendering something unusable and unrecognizable depending on the plant, the part of the plant that it is. So root balls, the growing media that you're growing, just plant out of, you know, depending on your grow style, stalks of the cannabis plants and leaves and branches removed from, and I should say cannabis, and make sure we, sorry, note to myself. Um, Leaves and branches removed from cannabis clones, seeding, seedlings, and other, no, I'll just fix that one later, and other cannabis plants. And then there is some language in here that even if you do have flour and it tests below 0.3% THC, meaning it's, you know, it could be considered hemp even if you weren't, I'm sure if you're, if you're meeting under that threshold and you're growing high THC cannabis plants, you, you got the wrong seeds, <laughs> first of all. That's such a low percentage of THC, but that flour does not need to be unrecognizable and unusable, and that's just providing some clarity to folks that might be looking to grow hemp and high THC cannabis as part of their diversified operation. So there are some methods that we're gonna put in here around rendering it unusable and unrecognizable. Again, um, this does not mean that it needs to be mixed with 50%. Again, it's a huge waste generator to do that because then a company might need to bring on food waste in order to mix it. And you know what I mean? I, don't, I think what we're trying to do is continuously improve our waste streams. You can mix it with paper waste, cardboard waste, food waste, grease, and other compostable oil waste. I have heard that some composters that pick up this material around the country, this is their least preferred way to do this. So we can have a discussion if it belongs here. Maybe we take it off just for the sake of clarity. So Bakashi, and I've, I've actually done a little research into this. It's almost like, you know, putting cannabis into a fermentation tank um, or barrel, and it kind of um, through like anaerobic digestion pro processes kind of uh, looks to break down that way. I don't think it's used very often, um, but you know, other states have allowed it as an option to render something um, you know, unusable and unrecognizable. Soil, sawdust, manure. I think the other things that we want to allow are on-site composting. If you have the ability to do this yourself at your site, that's awesome. A lot of folks do that in the hemp context right now. Um, anaerobic digestion, I don't know how familiar everybody is with that term, but that's allowing it to break down with the absence of oxygen. There's a lot of other kind of circular economy concepts that can really take root from that digested process, whether it's um, agricultural inputs, you can form some biogas, you can use it to heat and power. This takes a lot of more complicated processes that you can really do on farm, but maybe, you know, some other industries that are already doing some of these practices in state will look and want to take some of this uh, this bio content and, and really use it for their own operations. Our, our burning, you know, I know um, I know the Agency of Agriculture wants or the hemp program needs to burn stuff depending on its THC content. Sometimes I think I think we had talked about this. It's just allowing it as a very low cost option for getting rid of um, some of your cannabis waste. Pyrolyzing into biochar, essentially this is special ovens that um, essentially turn it into charcoal and it can be used as, um, you know, soil amendments for your next cannabis grow. And biomass gasification, that's almost like another step in, in a certain sense in the anaerobic digestion context. And I mean, if, if, if somebody has the tech to take this and look to make a fuel source out of it, that sounds great to me. Um, <laughs> I don't think it'll be like a commercially viable, you know, option, but hey, people are good at taking taking oils and, and figuring out a way to make use of them. So those are just options, again, the, uh, to render it unusable and unrecognizable. They're, in talking with compost companies, some might want you to have some type of mix 
Um, but we want to make sure that you have a lot of options and you don't need to call a compost company depending on the, you know, the way you choose to really dispose of your non-hazardous cannabis waste, meaning, you know, flour, other high THC kind of components of the cannabis plant, recognizing that you don't need to do the same thing for, you know, the other parts of the plant. So hazardous waste. So the hazard, and this is where I really need to still speak with members at DEC, um, but the must follow Vermont's Department of Environmental Conservation's Hazardous Waste Management Program. I kind of gave some examples of what would be considered hazardous waste. And I can, you know, there, there, there'll be other non-hazardous and hazardous waste in general um, buckets, so to speak, at different parts of the supply chain. And we can, and when I look to finalize this and put some more polish on it, give some examples at the manufacturing level, what would be non-hazardous and what would be hazardous, the wholesale level, at the lab level, at the retail level. We can really dive in. This is just kind of the broad parameters of it being disposed of from a public safety perspective. Um, one of the one of the things that in my conversations with DEC, um, they still need uh, to create more parameters on, and it's not specifically for this, but as different uh, vaping alternatives really are present in the state, is uh, defective return to expired or non-compliant disposable cannabis vape pens with internal lithium ion batteries. They're trying to figure out um, practical waste stream you know, methodologies for ion battery disposal. They don't have that completely figured out, or they didn't in October. Um, and it's another thing that I'm trying to follow up on. Other than that, you know, a lot of stuff that has solvent residuals on it will be considered hazardous, um, you know, chemical residues, that type of stuff. So it's really just trying to sig sig signal what's non-hazardous in the context of the plant versus all the other extraneous processes that are that are present in delivering, you know, a consumer a consumer oriented product. So that's really where I'm at now. It really needs to be vetted through our sister agencies, some of our consultants to make sure again the puzzle is fitting together correctly. But um, you know, this is kind of the the foundation, so to speak. Um you might not know the answer, but for hazardous waste, um, is there a different standard for farmers versus non-farmers? Uh, or, you know, do, do people that are kind of growing vegetables um, have to follow the department, of the DEC hazardous waste management program? So I don't know if DEC has any jurisdiction over anything considered farming. Yeah. That being said, I would imagine you know, that might be taken, you know, through the, some of the pesticide, you know, there's other, again, I, I, don't, I don't know the clean answer to your question. There's a lot of puzzle pieces that just need to fit together because we're straddling multiple agencies that take care of waste. And um, everybody recognizes that we're, we're rocking a hard place. <laughs> so it's just making sure everybody's comfortable with where we land on certain requirements. Yeah. Okay. That's all I got. It was great. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Um, okay, well, I think that that's probably, that covers what we set out to cover today. And I know that that was kind of a high level drive by on the on these issues. We need to um, put some final touches on them. But again, these are very complex issues. Bryn, thank you for getting us started on the trickiest ones. Um, so why don't we move to public comment? We are well ahead of schedule, but I think that um, we, we are through the agenda. So wh why don't we move to public comment? Um, we'll start with people that join via the link. Um, and if you join via link and you'd like to make a comment, please just raise your virtual hand. Um, and once uh, we get through those comments, then we'll move to um, the people that have joined via phone. All right, I'm not seeing any any comments. Um, Evo? Hey, good morning, guys. Um, I just had a comment about the, the flavors and the terpenes. Um, I, I do agree with that. Like, I know I'm, I'm sure the point is, is to like, 
not have like kids have bubble gum flavored vapes, right? I mean, we don't want to like, don't want people to like, whatever. We're not trying to like advertise to the youth or anything. But the way it's worded saying that only terpenes that occur in cannabis really leaves a huge, I mean, there's so many different terpenes, you know, there's like a lemon or like a sweet, you know, bubble gum flavor. Um, it's just going to leave a lot open to like how you, how you interpret the rules. Um, but I do think it's important not to have those, you know, candy flavored vapes and stuff like that necessarily. So I just wanted to like make that point. Um, and then, you know, the PEG and the additives, like, in my opinion, those are those are bad. I know there's not enough testing as to like what they really do for your health. Um, but any any like limitations on those, I think is a, a great choice. Great, thank you, Evo. Thank you, Evo. Any other comments from people that join via the link? Um, if so, just go ahead and raise your virtual hand. Brian? Yeah, a question comes up as to what the uh, integrateds are being doing with the uh, vape cartridges that they're using now, what they're being allowed to have. So I'm curious about that, if anybody can answer it, but um, that would be interesting to see how that parallels what you're doing right now. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, Jesse. Oh, yep. There you, there you go, honey. Hello there. Um, my name is actually Shane. Um, but uh, and I appreciate everything you guys have been doing for sure. Um, uh, in terms of the vapes, I think that uh, you know I don't I don't know enough about the propylene glycol and the vegetable glycerin and all that. Um, I know that, like uh, someone else just commented, you know, um, a lack of things that we know little about is nothing but good. Um, I don't know the route that should be taken, but more so, I think that um, we have an opportunity to not so much allow just terpenes that exist in marijuana, because like it was just discussed, there's hundreds of them that, yes, they exist in marijuana, but you can pull them from so many or other sources. So I think that, you know, it's a good opportunity to set um, the base work for having it just extracted from marijuana, right? I feel like there's a lot of things going on in the country with um, these vape cartridges that are essentially a distillate with zero terpenes from the actual marijuana plant. Now, they have terpenes that mimic them, but I think we're at a good place here where we could, you know, maybe have it be that you have to extract the terpenes from that marijuana. Um, we don't know what the other ones do, but I don't, I just see it as unnecessary. Um, I don't, you know, so I think that in the future, if we find out those added terpenes are bad for you, it's far more likely they're going to be bad for you than what you're actually pulling from the marijuana plant. Um, and that's about all I think. Thank you guys. Thank you. And, uh, I just want to say, um, this is such a, so much progress that um, we just had uh, someone from the legacy market speak, and I've been seeing it more and more as you guys have been having more meetings and the, the social equity and the way you guys have been holding yourself has been making people feel comfortable to speak. I just want to say a uh, good job because I was sitting here listening as usual, and my partner was here this time, and he was so impressed by you guys the way you are talking about it. And then he even wanted to say something. And that is a, that's a reflection of you guys. Because uh, when I first met him, he would not even go like take a picture with me. <laughs> so anyway, you guys are doing uh, so good. Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So um, if you if you join via the phone and you'd like to make a comment, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. There's we have two people that I can see that join via the phone. I'll just give that a second. And of course, if anyone joined via the link, please just raise your virtual hand. All right. Um, oh. THC analytics. 
Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, comment on a little thing that came to mind. And this is for everybody in the forum. Uh, we need to get the general public uh, involved in this. Not only uh, uh, the, the, us, the ones who are going to be in the market, but also the general public, because ultimately they're the ones who are going to end up voting yes or no on anything that we come up with here. Um, so one thing for everybody here in the forum is uh, let your friends, your family, your neighbors, you know, uh, know that this is happening. Uh, it, Vermont is moving to legalize cannabis, and we need to let them know that, that the meetings are happening to be involved. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would echo that. Anyone uh, that has networks out there, please share the work that we're doing, share our rules. Know that um, we have meetings at least weekly, um, and that uh, there's also our rules are being approved in the legislature as we speak. Um, anyone else, Fran? I I see your hand up again. If you wouldn't mind, just kind of maybe emailing us. So this is in this format. We don't do repeat comments. Um, we we will have our um, meeting on Friday, which is a public hearing where we will allow repeated comments. Um, or you feel free to email us. Um, and if I don't, I'll give it just one more second. Uh, anyone who wants to make a comment, virtual hand, um, or hit star six to unmute your phone. All right. Um, I guess we'll close the public comment window right now. Um, and I guess uh, before we adjourn, just a quick reminder again, this morning we announced that in 30 days, uh, meaning March 16th, we will open our pre-qualification application process and that we do have another meeting um, on Friday uh, to hear public comments on rules three and four. So um, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Julie and Kyle, and uh, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Likewise, thank you.